All right, and we are live. Okay, good, e good evening, everybody, and welcome to our The Life and Legacy of Reverend L. Francis Griffin Sr. program. My name is Kanan Townsend. I serve as the Associate Director and the Director of Education and Outreach at the Robert Russo Milton Museum located in Farmville, Virginia. And I also have the honor of serving as moderator for this program here this evening. We have celebrated Griffin Day, as we call it here, in some capacity for as long as I can remember. But in starting around 2017, we really wanted to make a deliberate effort to celebrate it around his birthday, which is September the 15th. And so we wanted to intentionally recognize him, intentionally recognize his efforts. And you know, in a little bit, I'm going to give him a little bit of background for those who might know a little bit about who Reverend Griffin was and why he's important. Um, but before that, I want to open up our program this evening with an invocation from the Reverend Dr. James Ashton of First Baptist Church here in Farmville. So I'm going to add him to the stream. I might have said good evening to all and God bless each one of you. Uh, it's good to be able to assemble uh, on this particular day to uh, honor one of my heroes who uh, just set uh, bra blazed a path that uh, it's hard for anybody to even come close to, but thank God his family are still tra trailblazers and that we have been the recipients of the greatness of a great man and all that he's done. And I'm so glad that we have the occasion to come back and remember uh, his legacy. And it goes on because God is great and he believed in the Lord. And because he had that great insight and foresight and love for others, God uh, used him as a special vehicle, not only in Farmville, but across the nation to let people know that when you're on the Lord's side and you're doing the greatness for the Lord, the Lord will bless you in many, many ways. And so is the case now with his family and all of us who stand uh, uh, in the corridors and in the shadows of this great man. Might we have uh, an invocation? The Lord and Heavenly Father, we come in the name of Jesus, Lord, to thank you for this special occasion where we honor, Lord, uh, a great man, the Reverend Dr. Francis Griffin, for all that he did, not only for our country, but for Farmville and for humankind at large. We come to honor him, Lord, to just raise up his name, to let others know that a great man traveled this way. And in the same token, his family are doing great things in the name of Jesus. He was a pioneer in so many ways, but most of all, he loved you and he loved people. And he gave, um, he gave his all to the cause of equity and liberty and justice for all. While it was a difficult time that he lived through, uh, we honor the spirit uh, of his tenacity and, and fortitude to get through difficult times, but still hold on to your unchanging hand. This evening, as we honor him, Lord, we look back, but we look forward to the possibilities that exist in each one of us who believe and receive and know that the Lord will make a way somehow. Thank you for this very special evening. We ask you, Lord, to bless all who have come, uh, all who are listening here today and all who may be seeing this uh, live, uh, and all of the Griffin family in particular, and the uh, Moton Museum for arranging this in a very special way. Lord, we're going through a crisis, Lord, but you're bigger than any crisis we could face. We faced crises during the civil rights era. We still face crises now, but we know, Lord, you will make a way out of no way. Thank you for what you've done. Help us to be instruments of thy peace and to march on to victory, realizing each step we make, somebody will be liberated in the name of the Lord. Thank you for this occasion. May your joy, your peace, and your understanding rest upon us as we continue to do your will. And as we remember the great man, the Reverend Dr. Francis Griffin, all hail be to God. Thank you for what he's done. And may, Lord, we give a testimony as to what we'll do when our time comes. And all God's children said, amen. Thank you so much, Reverend Ashton, for those words and for your invocation. And we very much appreciate it. And I think it's set us off on a, on a great start for this evening's program. So thank you so much for that. All right, so before we get started and introduce our panelists, um, I want to just take a moment and just read a few words about Reverend Griffin. Anybody who might be watching and might be a little bit unsure about Reverend Griffin or not uh, know everything that there, there, there might be to know, um, I'll give you a little bit of background here real quickly in his, in his bio. 
So the Reverend L. Francis Griffin Sr. was born in Norfolk, Virginia on September 15th, 1917, uh, the son of Reverend Charles Griffin, who in 1927 moved his family to Farmville when he accepted the pastorate at First Baptist Church. During World War II, L. Francis Griffin served as an infantryman in the 758th Tank Battalion in Europe. When he returned home, Griffin was determined to become a minister like his father. He enrolled in Shaw University in Raleigh, North Carolina. Upon his father's death in 1949, Griffin assumed the pastor of the First Baptist Church. Reverend Griffin became known as the fighting preacher, encouraging African-Americans in Prince Edward County to organize, to demand their first class citizenship rights. He led the Moton High School PTA in the local chapter of the NAACP. After their strike of April 1951, Moton students asked Griffin for advice. He encouraged them to reach out to the Virginia NAACP attorneys. He supported the students, mobilizing county citizens to join the Davis case, one of the five cases decided in the Brown versus Board of Education decision in 1954. When Prince Edward County Public Schools closed in 1959, Reverend Griffin led the community in demanding public education be restored at great personal cost to his family and himself. He worked to help children gain access to education through a variety of means during the crisis and lobbied the Kennedy administration to open the Prince Edward County Free Schools during the 1963-1964 school year. He and his children were plaintiffs in the Griffin versus County School Board of Prince Edward County Supreme Court case that reopened the schools in the fall of 1964. During this time, Griffin served as president of the Virginia State Conference of the NAACP for four years, served as a special consultant to the national NAACP. Reverend Griffin was a mentor and inspiration to generations of Prince Edward County students from the walkout generation of 1951 to the lockout generation of 1959 to 1964. To so the Moton High School protests, the Moton High School students who would eventually protest in 1969 for better schools. Reverend Griffin passed away of a heart attack on January 18th, 1980, and he's buried in Oddfellow Cemetery in Farmville, actually right across the street here from the museum. So. To get started with our program, let me add all of our panelists to the stream. And I know I've said this before, but I want to start off by thanking you all so much for, for being here, for taking the time out. Uh, this is a, I'm very excited for this, this program. This is unlike anything that we have really done before. Um, and I just want to thank you all for, for taking your time to really be here this evening. So now let's go ahead and get started because y'all are not here to see me uh, read from, from my copy. So if you all wouldn't mind getting us started just by introducing yourselves, maybe for, for our audience, maybe start in, in sibling old order from eldest to youngest. Yes, I'm, uh, my father's full name was Leslie Francis Griffin. I think when he uh, started on his ministry, he became known as L. Francis Griffin. Many of his youth friends called him Leslie. I am Leslie Francis Griffin, Jr. But most of you all who grew up with me know me as Skippy, and that's been shortened over the years to Skip. I'm the eldest. You get on. You have to unmute. Okay. Not just having some problems. My name is Coquise Griffin Epps. I am the fourth child in the Griffin family. Um, I'm also known as Cookie, and um, I'm just happy to be here this evening. Thank you. All right, Naja, if you want to introduce yourself, I think you're. I think we got you. freezing yeah we have some tech some tech errors hmm. eric if you want to introduce yourself because i don't I, i'm not getting anything from the side right now sure I, i'm eric griffin um i'm the youngest um the baby of the family and uh i think if i whenever i go back home everybody back home calls me ricky so uh, that's one thing when you go back home, people will kind of put you in your place and remind you of and where your place was in the family 
they always say you're just Ricky the baby and we, you just where we allowed you to hang out around us all and to be a part of our group uh, and loved you. So, and I'm just, just glad to, glad to be here tonight. Well, yeah, as, as, as the baby also of six myself, Eric, I can, I can, I can sympathize a little bit with that <laughs> being the, the baby of the group and just being allowed to tag along. Sometimes. Not, can you hear us? Hmm. We can kind of hear you. Can you hear us? I see she comes through. Hmm. So let's go ahead and get started with some questions. Hopefully, we can get Najee here as well. Um, so I want to just kind of start off uh, reflecting upon just kind of how far that we've, we've come over the years, just kind of from when you all were children, um, from, from the time back before you were born as well, certainly. Uh, did you ever think kind of years ago when you all were, were living the stuff that we now kind of talk about here at the museum, did you ever think that this story and the people within the story would become as, as big and prominent as, as they were? Ever in your wildest dreams, did you imagine that people all over the state and the country will be talking about this history that, that you all live. Um, I, that's an interesting way to put it. I, what I imagined was that the, what, what, the, what made the story interesting and compelling uh, are the results it achieved. And I think that we come from a family of faith and my father and mother and all of our grandparents and great grandparents and great great grandparents were people of faith. The way that I would answer this question is, even as a young boy, um, I had no doubt that the movement would be successful. I, thinking about, you know, the media has changed and the size of a story is much larger today than it was then. I never thought about it in those terms. I thought about whether the objectives of the movement would be achieved or not. And I, we inherited the faith of our parents and I thought that the movement would be successful. I knew that we were engaged in historical times and I had no doubt that the outcome would be uh, in the direction that we uh, wanted it to go in. Any, any other any other thoughts? Well, I think I had a kind of a simplistic outlook um, <coughs> being as young as I was at the time. I um, I just kind of thought it was the natural way of life for mm -hmm. everyone. Um, yes, I agree. I didn't think that we were any different. Um, and because this is what our household was composed of, the constant dialogue surrounding the whole uh, school situation, I just assumed that everyone lived their life this way all over the United States. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Sorry. I think ahead. Cookie makes a good point in that um, the movement, of what was going on in Prince Edward, as I saw it through my eyes as a child, was that a lot of interesting people were in and out of our home all the time, and that was fascinating, and a lot of different people who were from different places and different backgrounds, different racial groups, different religions. Um, now looking back, it wasn't unusual at the time, but uh, that that was our life often for most of the years uh, throughout uh, the school situation and afterwards. So. 
I just didn't think of it as being that unusual. But now that she makes those comments, uh, maybe it was <laughs> it seemed normal then when you were in the midst of it. Naja, can you hear us fine? She was good for a minute, I think. Um, well, I, I kind of have a follow up. Y'all kind of inspired a, a bit of a follow up. I mean, when did you all realize that what had happened here was, was special and that other people didn't really experience the same way, even just the idea of segregation in general, right? People didn't experience that in the same way as we did here in Prince Edward County. When was, what was the moment that you were like, yeah, Y'all didn't do this too, right? This was different. Um, yeah, what made y'all realize that? I think for me is when um, we moved or went to my grandmother's farm in the Sweetsboro, New Jersey, where I started school. And I actually started school at the age of seven. So I missed the first year of school. And um, not only were the kids allowed to go to school, but in Swedesboro, the schools were fully integrated. So it was like, um, oh, so people do live differently and people do have access to schools and education. So for me, I think it was then around the age of seven for me. Yeah, I think um, I think it was much later that I realized that it was an interesting report that Cookie raised initially, you know, but it was much later that I realized that everyone wasn't doing it. But I, again, as, as Ricky has said, because so many people came to the house, starting with the journalist Carl Rowan, and then uh, you know the, the, the people from Richmond who were constantly flowing, uh, you know uh, Sam Tucker, Henry Marsh, Oliver Hill, and early on before he joined SCLC, Reverend Y. T. Walker. And then friends of my uncle, like Sam Proctor and others, uh, you know, I, I I had a sense that you know we were engaged in something uh, that was historically important. I, I do share Cookie's belief that I thought everybody was doing that. I later discovered that that wasn't so, <laughs> but but it was a real experience, you know. Uh, and and then of course our own local prophet, uh, you know. Our father was a, a mentee of uh, Vernon Johns, and he was always present, especially in the early years, uh, <laughs> with his eccentric ways. And so I remember going off to <laughs> college, and I was talking about Vernon Johns, and the guy stopped me, and he said, you actually knew Johns? And, uh, you know, so, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's paradoxical, I think we would say. It's like, we both thought that this is the way everybody lived, but you begin to develop a sense over time, well, maybe not, <laughs> you know, and that was driven mostly by the people who came through the house and the constant flow of visitors. Great. Um, so going on kind of to the, it's similar, but shifting to just a little bit, uh, we, you know, I read Reverend Griffin's, you know, it's kind of his biography, just kind of the real fast kind of version of, of his life. And of course, we have you all here with us to, to really, really tell us about him. But I just am curious if there's, if you all think that there might be a, a common misconception that people might hold about Reverend Griffin that, that maybe that you all would have certainly a different perspective on, you know, we know him as 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 the man, as the prophet, as as the legend, but just out of curiosity to you all, you know, do you think there's a common misconception that, that people might hold about your father? Hmm. What? Go ahead, Cookie. I I was waiting for you. No. Okay. <laughs> you got this. One. I would say that I would say that perhaps 
in his later years, he had questions about whether or not integration worked and whether or not uh, whether or not it was worth it all in Prince Edward. I think he wrestled with that uh, issue. Uh, Skip can tell you he had opportunities to, after things died down, to take churches in Philadelphia or New Jersey and uh, in Massachusetts and other places, but he turned down. One thing he said to me was that when I asked him why didn't we get to go to some of those places of move, and he said he felt obligated to stay in Prince Edward. He he was deeply involved in that situation. So many of the young people at that time suffered, and he felt obligated to stay. But I, I know he wrestled uh, quite a bit in his later years about whether integration achieved what they thought it was going to achieve and was it really worth it all? Yeah. If I'm wrong, well, skip for some of the No, no, you're written, right. I that's kind of what I got from you. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I just was going to add, you know, I think when people see him as a public figure, I wanted to humanize him a bit, you know. And uh, one thing is he had deep friendships uh, and, and he had, uh, but, but, you know, I think a lot of people wouldn't realize how, how, what a sense of humor he had. He loved to tell jokes and he loved to play little, yes. little tricks and stuff on us. Yeah. And the other thing is he loved to hunt and it wasn't just, I mean, he was a really good hunter. And I think that people, most people don't except his dear friends don't know that part about him. Uh, and he loved uh, he loved Prince Edward County, and he had friends that go, went back to the time he first came here. But I would say the biggest two things is how much he loved to read and how much he loved to hunt. And one and and, and one of his dearest friends was uh, Warren Reed, and they were always if they weren't doing funerals or driving down to Richmond, they were in the woods hunting, you know. And, and that consumed a lot of his time. Uh, and I'm not sure that we all enjoy, shared our daddy's dietary uh, likes uh, for the game that he brought <laughs> into the house. <laughs> but he he wasn't hunting for trophies. He loved to eat rabbit stew. Or mom could prepare rabbit in multiple ways. He loved venison. He loved the birds. But he was an avid hunter, you know. And I don't think many people who who met him later in life as he his health was failing would know that about him. He, he and he and Mr. Reed and the fellows around there, Reed's brothers and stuff. And, uh, they'd spend day, all day in the woods, you know? Um, uh, yeah. Yes. I can remember, um, a lot of things that my mother didn't think were healthy for my father. Um, he would have me go in the kitchen and cook when she wasn't home. And one of the things that I remember cooking for him was <laughs> raccoon. <I remember. laughs> that was the worst. <laughs> What'd you say, Cookie? Raccoon. Oh yeah. <laughs> Cook raccoon. Yeah. Coon meat, as yeah. they say, but that was one of the worst, I think. But I, I agree with Skip. He had an awesome sense of humor. Um, and a lot of people may not have known the true, one of the true joys of his life was his grandchildren. The ones that he got to be he passed away. Um, he loved his grandchildren dearly. And they loved him. Um, I just want to say something since I'm seemingly on the show now. <laughs> oh, well. Oh, baby. Sorry. We'll, we'll do our best to make sure she gets gets back in. Um, well, and, and you all, you know, you've given already a little bit of insight into, into Reverend Griffin. Your father, but and, and I've, I've asked Skip this in the past, but feel free to, to add anything else as well, Skip. But uh, I feel like people don't ask about your mother 
as much or or, or enough, you know. And so I'm, I'm just curious if if, if anybody wants to share. You know, Naja, can you hear us? Hello. Hey. Okay. What did you say? No, no. I, I was. It's a, did you want to pick up from where you left off, if you can? Well, yeah. I, I just have no idea where we are in this conversation now, and I'm so sorry because I was so excited about this. But um, I feel like the last. What was the last question you asked? That's what I missed. So I was asking if there, so if you felt like, if, uh, did you feel like there was any kind of common, common misconceptions about your father or things that people just might not know about him? Oh, um, no, I think it was, it's, it's kind of hard to separate. Well, I mean, it, it's like you separate Reverend Griffin, the fighting creature. Oh, so close. Mm -hmm. Yeah, almost. Yeah, we'll keep going. I hope, hope we'll be able to get our stable connection soon. Um, so so yeah, I want to give everybody the chance as well. I mean, just to tell us a little bit about 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 Adelaide Griffin, about your mother. I mean, I, I, I actually had somebody contact me, uh, probably right before the pandemic started, probably around January, maybe December of 2019, even, and they were looking for information essentially on kind of first ladies of the civil rights movement. Um, and so that brought her to, to Adelaide Griffin after she was about Reverend Griffin. I was like, well, I don't, you know, I don't really know exactly what to point to you. So i um, curious if anybody wants to share some information, some memories about, about, about Adelaide, about the mother. Well, well yeah, I, I remember as a boy, go ahead. No, you can go ahead. Okay. <laughs> oh, I was okay. just going to say just her love of art. Uh, her love of, um, of of life, really. I, I can, uh, one thing I can remember as a boy, uh, the Richmond uh, Art Museum, the Virginia Art Museum would uh, send out a truck to Farmville and they would park the trailer in the parking lot at First Baptist where you could go and, and see some artwork. And my mother would dress me in Sunday clothes. She would dress up and we would go and visit the Mobile Art Museum. Uh, I can remember as a boy, her taking me during the Christmas holiday season at the old state theater. They would have uh, it shows during the week, during the daytime matinees. And that was, she took me to see the sound of music, uh, Bambi, and a host of movies that uh, really touched my life. And I can remember, I remember her too, having a youthful spirit. She would get outside, come outside with us and play uh, kickball. Uh, she would ride bikes with us, and, and, and we were really proud when some of the other uh, kids in the neighborhood would say, look at Miss Griffin, riding a bicycle. So that made me proud that my mother was young enough, healthy enough, and had such a youthful spirit enough that she would actually get out and play kickball, ride bikes, or whatever with us. But she was just a, just a great mom, and, and of course, later in life, you could always talk to her, talk anything, and particularly if you were down or you life facing a difficulty in life, she had a great deal of wisdom to share. And I would say that we all would look at her as being, you know, one of our one of our good friends in life, confidants. I think uh, you know, you know, my, my father was a wise and courageous man. But as I got older and he died young, I discovered, you know, um, the older I got, they say, the wiser my mother became. I was, you know, I, she was a woman of deep faith, but also deep thinking. And she could comment on, uh, she would give me advice and or little principles about life and about different things. And most of the time they were pretty accurate. And I 
I was always amazed and they would work in Farmville or they would work in Harvard, you know, uh, and as, as, as Rick has said, she was a really good artist, but you know, in those days, it wasn't considered practical to be an artist. And she also loved teaching. I'm not saying that she was forced into teaching because she couldn't do be an artist, but uh, she would have been done more with her art, but she loved to teach and she loved to develop people. And my mother always felt that there was something in every person worth developing. So you might say that my father was called to preach uh, I think m she made it pretty clear to us that she was called to teach and and uh, and she taught us, but she taught anybody who would sit still for a minute with her. I mean, she she was called to teach. And uh, so I would say art and and I and I re I'm a little older, so I would recall going to dinner out at uh, Darlington Heights with, for some time, the brief time that uh, Dr. Johns and Mr. Altona lived out there. And the conversation that she and my mother had about music and art, uh, fine arts, black arts, uh, it was just astonishing. Uh, and I later discovered that Miss Johns was one of the, the world, one of the country's top musicologists. And my mother didn't seem lost in the conversations with us. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's so if uh, I think that if our father was known as a Renaissance man, then our mother was known as a Renaissance woman because they complemented each other very well. Um, she loved my father dearly, but um, within the household, she definitely expressed her opinion on everything. Uh, <laughs> put it like <laughs> Right. Um, and the other thing to uh, expand on what Eric and Slick said, she also um, just had a great love for as much as my father loved the children in the community, she also loved the children of Prince Edward County. And there are many people who have singled us out to remind us of the lunches they had at our house or the meals that my mother served them because if you were playing around our house for meal time, then you were automatically invited in for a meal, um, a snack or whatever time of day it was. So we were very fortunate when they handed out parents, for sure. Mm -hmm. Nasha, I had asked uh, if, if anybody had memories of your mother in particular to share, just because I feel like she's not certainly not talked about as much um, with regards to the broader movement, with regards to your family unit. And so I was asking if there's any memories or things you want to share about your mother. Well, yeah, I think my mom, I think that because of her, the experience for us of school closing was just totally different because she made every day a learning experience in the house. Somehow um, we had uh, mandatory lessons to do, but she made everything, everything that we did was a lesson in life or a lesson to learn. And we had art and we had music. And on the rainiest of days, you know, she was so talented. She would make little um, animals literally i mean fabulous little animals out of cornstarch and she would fashion these circuses for us on the dining room table with elephants i mean zebra i mean i'm sure a lot of people don't understand what happened in our house like once we closed the door because this woman was an amazing woman she really is or was an amazing person who never ever complained about her life never complained about what we didn't have, never complained about my father being away so much. Everything that happened, she made it a joy for all of us and would not let us. And I think our parents, like I'm just so lost like where we are in this conversation, but the things that I want to make sure people knew about our parents is the things that they taught us, you know, and they taught us like to be humble. They thought of, taught us to be loving and kind 
And the lesson I came, one of the earliest lessons we learned is from my dad, who said, there is no one who is greater than you, but you are also not less than anyone else. So you are, and he wanted us to just always stand on our own two feet, be proud of who we are, be proud of where we came from. They taught us to love God first, our family, and our community. And those were like very important to the structure of our family life. And so that's why we have this great love, still all of us, for farm um, And there are things that people say were happened to f people in Farmville, and it was. It was not a great thing that the schools closed. But because of the schools <coughs> closed, so many other great things happened in Farmville. And so many people had other experiences. And I think Ricky was mentioning that all the people who came to Farmville to visit, that we would not have had the opportunity to visit um, or to meet. And I, I just feel like they they prepared us for whatever was going to happen in the world. In that, the living room at 703 Eli Street, we learned how to deal with the world <laughs> as an adult. Like when we became adults, you know, they gave us like solid foundations, um, definitely solid uh, belief in like who you were and to never let, allow anybody to make you feel less, less of a person than you are. And so we didn't really get bogged down about people calling us out of our names or not wanting to be around us because our parents taught us you are great you are just as great as anyone else and i never ever are you to feel lesser than anyone so the school closings i think we all for a minute thought wow how are you can you do this to us you know what have we done to people but even in that, that was a lesson it taught us. I think our parents taught us that he... She said a lot of good things. So. Yeah. Got in a good run that time. Yeah. 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 And she actually, I want to give you all a chance to follow up on what she was saying as well, because she actually was answering what she might be back. She was answering one of the questions I had a little bit later. Um, <laughs> hey, you're back. I'm back. <laughs> I find this is kind of but anyway. <laughs> so I think that our life growing up, I just say like get everything I can say in before it cuts me off again. <laughs> and I think growing up in Farmville, we made some lifelong friends. I mean, our friendships that we developed in Farmville are still the friends that we have today. There was there's no difference. We can call anybody that we grew up with and start talking to them. And there's not a lull in the conversation. It's just right back where we started from. We stay in touch with each other. We help each other in terms of the community, like whatever we can ever do to help the community. We're more than willing to do because that's what we were taught to do. Um, yeah. And I think, I think Adley Griffin, was probably, mm, I don't know if I want to say she's the strongest person, but I think without her, Reverend Griffin wouldn't have been with who he was. And that's for sure, because she was really a backbone for him. And his that's the place he could come when the world was like beating on him and just crushing him and he felt defeated. He could always come and she sure would tell him, sit down at the table. <laughs> And she would start bringing out the dishes that she made. And I mean, he just felt like a king in that house always. And so I think that gave him the motivation and energy that he needed to fight the good fight. And I think it came from her. I think that without the kind of woman that she was, I don't think he would have been the kind of man. I just felt like, I think Cookie said too, it's just that they complimented each other and they blended. It was just a really blended relationship. So we had, I would say, probably what, just a really ideal, happy little growing up life. And I think my siblings will agree. We always talk about it. it's like the fun that we had growing up. Um, we never felt like there were times like, yeah, there were times like we didn't have like a lot of food to eat. But Mrs. Griffin would take 
the smallest little things in the house and then turned it into this gourmet meal. And so we just, like I said, we just never felt um, without. And we always felt loved and we always felt supported by the people, well, most of the people in the community will say that, that there was a real strong, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway. <laughs> Trying to think what else I wanted to say before I get cut off. Anyway, you, you got it in. <laughs> you got it in. This time. Yeah, that's good. And and that was actually a very wonderful now to transition into the another question I was going to ask, which I'll go ahead and ask now. Um, which are what are some lessons that lessons that you learned from your parents um, that you have you know, maybe passed to your own children? grandchildren, friends, community, you know, things that your parents taught you that you want everybody, everybody could probably learn this. What are some things that you might uh, share that you learned from your parents? And Dodge, you've already shared some of that, but if there's anybody that can add. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, it's like, I, I think we, we learned how to share. We had to share. We learned how to share. Everything that we had had to be shared. Like Cookie said, like if, I don't care how much food my mother made, if somebody came to the door, we were going to divide it even more. Um, they taught us that we always have to help each other and help our community and help our people. That we should never let somebody go hungry. We should never allow somebody not to have a place to sleep. Or we should never allow them to feel unloved or unwanted. Yes, yes. Um, I, I would say for me, uh, and this lesson has carried me, and sometimes when I talk to people about the civil rights movement, and I'm asked, how do you think the civil rights movement was successful and how do you compare it to movements of today? And I would say this, our parents were of deep, deep faith. Uh, and Reverend Ashton said in his opening, prayer the Lord will make a way somehow. I think that's probably the mantra of uh, our parents. And I think our daddy would say, and this people want to attribute to him great strength, and he did have great strength. They want to attribute to him great courage, and he did have great courage. I don't know, Ricky, talking to you, and you and Nod and Cookie, but the one name that he liked was the fighting preacher. But people focus on the fighting part, not the preacher part, you know. Right. That he that he was a man of deep <laughs> faith, and uh, you know, I don't know if you all would be comfortable with me saying this, but um, in 1962, you know, uh, he he had a real illness, and the three of us three of us on the call discovered him. He had lost a lot of blood. And we were wanting him to just give up everything. And he went to the Veterans Hospital in Richmond, and he stayed there 37 days. And I went with the gentleman, uh, Claude Saunders. Reed, Mr. Reed got Claude Saunders to drive us down. He said, "Yo, Doc, you just ride with Doc and talk to him and keep him focused. And, uh, and I took him into the Veterans Hospital. He had lost so much blood. And the doctor came out and talked to me. He said, Son, what is it that your father does? And I said, well, he's a preacher. And he started taking off his glasses and his pen and putting it away. He said, well, maybe that explains it. And I said, what, what do you mean, sir? He said, I can't give you, son, one good reason why your dad is still alive. He said, I can't give you one good medical reason why he's still alive. He said, but this I know, he's going to walk out of here on his own two feet upright. And I, and I think that... Um, I say that to people, yes, he was strong, but the strength came from the Lord and the same with my mother. Uh, and that's one thing mm -hmm. they gave us, you know, there's nothing in life that the Lord can't handle. And I don't, you know, people say, oh, you playing with me now? No, 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 cause I saw it. And I heard it from, from a accomplished doctor. He said, I can't, I never will forget that. I'm 74 years old. I was right around 15. And he said, I can't give you one good re medical reason why your father's still alive. But this I know, he's going to walk out of here on his own two feet upright. And everything he did, he they were driven by faith. 
and they felt that they were called to do the things that they did and that uh they that's 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 the one great gift that they passed on to us you know Mm -hmm. i agree and i think that's what our our family our household was based on it was a faith-based household i mean it just and it taught us um well they taught us like i said it's just like my mom and i think about that now and i share this because this is like a when mommy was passing and i said i told cookie well I, we all know this but i was there with her at the hospital one day by myself and she was talking like she had been not talking in a coma for days and she just started i was sitting there and she started talking so i sat up and i was so excited because i was thinking oh my gosh she's talking and but she wasn't talking to me she i, I know she was talking to god because she was telling that she was saying about how they raised their children she said all my children were raised in a christian home i taught them all the lord's mm -hmm. prayer they have all been baptized they and it was just she was just going on this whole her whole like a resume of her religious <laughs> you know to, to like i'm ready like i felt she was saying i'm ready to go and here are my uh, credentials this is what i've done <laughs> This is what, you know, and it really, literally, I told it, it just, I was so, I, it made me really happy though, because then I know that this is like, this is the mother that we know, my mother and my father, that they loved the Lord from the beginning to the last breath they took, they loved the Lord. And when she had this conversation, at first I thought she was talking to me, and then I realized she's not talking to me at all. And then I realized, I think, how strong her faith was because that last those last minutes her last conversations was between her and god and um it just really moved me and it, it just made me do a lot of thinking about my life and you know there may be some changes i could make a few <laughs> but <laughs> okay. that's a sibling joke so, i'm sorry Anyway, back to well, serious. You're totally fine. Um, I, uh, I'll, I'll say, I mean, I, well, I, I appreciate y'all's willingness to, to, to share this with us. Um, and, I, and I can, I, I'm not going to call anybody specifically out in the comments, but y'all are, are getting a lot of love in the comments. So make sure when this is, when, when we're done with this, go and look at some of the comments um, that people are, are oh. typing about, about the parents and about their relationships with, with, with you all. Um, they're showing you a lot of love. Um, so I guess to, to pivot just a little bit, um, we've talked a little about the lives and the, and the legacy. I mean, what do you all want to see happen next um, with, with regards to the legacy of both your parents? I mean, if you want to open it up broader to the, to the broader story, I mean, what do you all hope to see next? I mean, I know since I've been here at Moton, um, we've seen a lot of stuff happen. Uh, we've seen statues, we've seen holidays. Um, but what's what's next? What do you all hope to happen next with regards to, to the legacy of your father and, and both your parents? Hmm. Hmm. And we talk about this a lot as siblings. Hmm. And I think, Skip, I think I'll let you take this question because I think it's one that, that you've um, addressed many times with us. Think? Well, no, I think everybody should weigh in. And I think that what we've chosen to be in life, we continue some part of the, the work that they were trying to do. Uh, I think, you know, with Ricky serving as a pastor and, you know, other ways in the community. Uh, you know, the, the, I gave a speech once that, uh, the, you know, when, when Moses died, uh, you know, the passage says, Moses, my servant is dead. Basically, I'm, you know, paraphrasing. But, you know, and people wanted to focus on the, what Moses has done, but what, Moses, what, what the Bible was focusing on is what, what's ours to do. Look, there are still things undone, and there's still things cycling back. So I think rather, I'm not a big fan of monuments and 
holidays and all that kind of stuff. What I'm a fan of is looking at the life that a that a servant of God led who tried to change the world and figuring out what's my version of that life. And we you know, you know, if I had to choose something to give money to and I hope I don't offend anybody here. I'd give the money to Stacey Abrams rather than to a monument. Because to me, Stacey Abrams is carrying on the work of our father. You know, uh, I'd give the money to to to, to, to the, all of the women who followed her in Georgia. Uh, and I think that uh, that that it's up to each one of us to look at the life of a servant of the Lord and say, what's mine to do in the time in which I live, and what's mine? What are the problems that I have to address in my time, and what of the, what of the essence of the people can I take out of there? With how much courage do I need? How 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 developed does my mind need to be? Um, you know, uh, how much should I engage with others? You know, you, this thing is you can't do this thing alone. It, it requires. Uh, commitment in, a, in the ground and in faith, and then joining with other people in community, and to, and, and and attempting to do that. Thing. But so, I would say to everybody, my my hero who replaces my father in life, she'll never replace him in my heart. Is Stacy Abrams, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I think. Um, Education was so important, especially like daddy and mommy both. Daddy, you know, fighting to get the schools back open and mommy a teacher. I think that I would like to see us all really focus on still there is definitely not an equality in education for all people, for all colors of kids. I mean, and it's still a great divide and it really bothers me that we're in 2021 and the things that I know my dad fought for, like I said, <coughs> fought for integration. He was fighting for equal justice and for us to have the same opportunities as other people. And I think for them, and I think for me, and I think Skip, Cookie, Ricky, we talk about this a lot. It's like we need to do more for our kids. We need to make sure that our kids, there are so many kids in our communities that don't have access to computers or libraries or, and I just feel like we need to start focus because we need to bring our kids up to a level so that they're equal playing field. And I think then when they don't have access to things, I think when my daughter started teaching, like having grown up <laughs> in California, you have like the West Side and then you have, you know, South Central, and so when my daughter taught in Compton, her heart was broken where she said when she, the first lesson she gave kids to go home and draw a picture, or one of the first lessons, you go home and draw a picture of the beach. And when she came back, she said, nobody had the homework. And it was like, one, they don't have paper and pencils. Mm -hmm. Two, they were like, what does the beach look like? Mm -hmm. And so these are Southern mm -hmm. California kids who don't live that far from the ocean, but because of where they live, they're left out of so many opportunities that I feel that we all should, we need to really focus on making sure our kids are as educated and have access to the same kinds of, um, what am I saying, you know, accessibility to things like computers, libraries, money, you know, for trips and like that. And I, I really feel like, I think that for my parents, I would like to see us all, I mean, there's so many things, but I think education is just one that was really close and was very important to their hearts, so. And I feel the same way. Yeah, I, I think, think uh, for all that we went through, um, to have access to equal public education all of these years later is still not serving the entire country. Um, there are so many people who, I'm a firm believer that public schools should work for everyone. Um, 
and they don't. And it really, uh, it makes me sad. I live right outside, well, I live in Howard County, Maryland, right outside of the District of Columbia. But there are areas in Maryland where people, um, they live in these large tax-based counties, but they have uh, substandard public schools. And I think that that saddens me more than anything. Is that after all these years, public education is just not working. And I, I don't think that private education or uh, vouchers are the answers. I think that we need to put emphasis back on making public education work for everyone. Yeah, exactly. Reverend Eric, what were you about to say? No, you, you all, I was just going to say, you and Audra touched, hit the nail on the head. The, the Stacey Abrams of the world who are fighting for our right to vote, uh, which, you know, our father fought in that battle too. And Education. I've I've done I've had positions in the public school system. I've done substitute work. My daughter also taught in the public school systems system here in Guilford County. And there's a lot of disparity within the county system. Um, mm -hmm. We've all you all have touched on this, and it's heartbreaking. And they use the strategies of different strategies to kind of water down the programs. Um, like voucher systems and, and charter schools. But even within the uh, Guilford County school system itself, uh, parents who have, are able to give their children more opportunities and they channel a great deal of money through the PTA uh, and other ways uh, uh, that give their kids opportunities that African-American kids or uh, Latino kids in the neighborhood schools that are that are that are lacking aren't able to have so yeah we just need to continue to fight <laughs> yeah uh, so, well, so big, right now that we can't we can't do something about the vote ensuring that african americans and people of color and latinos will have their vote that's a big problem so, Ken, and I want to go back to something you said. You asked the question, is it something about our dad that they wouldn't know? He, he, he was a little bit of a technology geek. I remember, you know, I we used to read the Dick Tracy thing, and Dick Tracy had this watch he could talk to. And he said, you know, in your lifetime, they actually going to yeah. be able to do this. I said, man, you crazy. He said, no, you watch. And uh, and so, you know, it's not, it's, it's there, you know, but, and so I'm saying, I want to add to one of the battles that I know he would be involved in, and it's not a race, it is, it has racial uh, context, but uh, it also has rural context. And I don't think America can, you know, people throw around, I don't think America can be great if we don't have broadband band access for people in rural areas. You know, you know, you know, people talk about our people in rural areas, such as what we all grew up in and, and such as what Farmville and Prince Edward and Cumberland and Buckingham. We need broadband access so that you're not, you know, so that people can access the, the, the World Wide Web. And, uh, and I know he would be fighting for increased broadband access. He would be out there beating the drums and trying to find as many allies as he could. And so would mom, you know. That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, I certainly, I did not know your parents myself personally, but um, through through you all, knowing you all, the work that you all do, the way you all speak, I can certainly probably see the type of people that your parents were through for you all. And I think that's been echoed in the comments. Certainly go like I really want to encourage y'all to go look at these comments because <laughs> it's uh it's quite emotional. <laughs> you all have a lot of a lot of people showing you showing you still showing your love in the comments and, and your parents as well. Um so I want to be mindful of your time. We're getting close to the hour mark and I don't want to keep y'all for we could talk about this all day, I know. Um but I want to Pivot one more time, and I'll see if there's any questions in the comments. 
um, that, that we might ask kind of going towards closing. Um, but completely different direction. But let's just say that they were to make a feature film about about your parents. They're making a feature film about their lives. You know, who do you all personally cast to play Reverend L. Francis Griffin Sr. and Adelaide Griffin in, in their film? Well, my first choice got vetoed, <laughs> and that was Denzel. For Denzel. <laughs> my family vetoed. Yeah, I always vote Denzel. for Denzel, too. So. <laughs> nah. Well, <laughs> and I know you guys a public for. forum, but mm, <laughs> I just couldn't imagine Denzel is my daddy. I'm sorry. <laughs> Wow, you got a crush on Denzel. <laughs> okay. But Skippy, who did you and Cookie say y'all would have play daddy? Well, if it had to be somebody that's alive now, as opposed to we could resurrect one of the old timers, I think Jeffrey Wright, you know, even though he does not have the girth, but he has the depth to handle daddy's depth. And his his uh, and his nuances and stuff. I like Jeffrey Wright. I, I agree. That was my first yeah. choice for Daddy. Yeah, yeah, that's a good choice. It's a good choice. And what was what was the other choice we said we were talking about? Um, oh, not James Earl Jones. No, Ricky uh, mentioned uh, Austin Davis. If, yeah, Ossie Ossie Davis, Davis, if, if he alive. was alive, Ossie yeah. Davis. Yeah. Oh, if he were alive, he would be number. He'd go to number one. Yeah. 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 I agree with you, Rick. Yes. Yeah. And then we'd have to have Ruby D if we have Ossie Davis. Then. then we'd have yeah, to have yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if we go with Ossie, we go with Ruby. D. That's and true. the other woman we okay. chose for mommy was. Um, Octavia Spencer? Yes. Mm -hmm. Or Angela Bassett. Yeah. <laughs> One of those. That's an interesting question. Yeah. I'm going to ask you. Yeah, I think you. Octavia. I'm the thing I like about. I think I, the, uh, I think the thing I like about Octavia Spencer, I think she could handle Mom's warm side. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I like her yeah. a lot. I think. Yes. Definitely. I think she'd be my first choice for mom. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, I think I think this question when, when we came up with it is an exercise of speaking into existence. <laughs> the, the story is there, right? So somebody would need to write a screenplay, but they wouldn't really need to fabricate much of anything. They just need to write it and cast it, and let's get it. Let's get it done. I hope hope that'll happen someday. Um, yeah. So, well, my, son. my <laughs> wife is always telling me. Yeah, yeah. She said, "If I don't want to write the story about all the rich characters we had out there, she was going to write it because I'm all we always telling stories." But yeah, the script oh, yeah. would write itself. <laughs> it would. Like yeah, it is. It is like Farmville. I feel was it just really was an ideal childhood. It literally was. And people, you know, and I've said this to my grandchildren, and I think one of them said to me once, like, Grandma, how can you say that when they closed the schools, the people were really mean? But I said, but those were those people. It's not all the farm bill. That does not represent farm bill. That represented a specific, specific, I'm sorry, not Pacific, specific. Um, Pacific. <laughs> <laughs> yes, specific um, group of people but not all of Farmville. And I, so I explained to them, you know, that no, we didn't even know that we didn't, that they didn't like us. We didn't know, we didn't know people didn't like us. I mean, literally we, our little life was so perfect. Like, you know, we had everything we need, the store, you know, we were just telling like, and even my daughter was telling me stories about, she remember when she was little walking up to Mr. Dean's and walking over to Mr. Coles and walking to the diamond and, you know, so, we had everything, our nurses, we had the nurses, we had the dentists, the doctors, our stores, the little stores we went to, the cleaners. So we felt we were fine. And only <laughs> when they came and told us, you're not going to go to school, did we think that 
there might be some problem in farm book. But before that, and even after that, I have to say, you know, even going through that, that is still my home. I always call, say, I'm going home, and I've had friends say, you lived in California since 1980. Mm, doesn't matter. Farmville is home. I will always call it home. So when I leave to go there, I say, I'm going home. I but agree. It's the place that I feel the best. That's really interesting, because it's like whenever I need to feel really grounded and loved and protected and held, I always say, that's why... I, people in Farmville why y'all would see me there so much because I need to come back and get some of that Farmville love so I go on with my day and go on with my life. Yeah. I mean I, I think we would all we would all share, especially the older three, uh, uh you know like Miss Lucille Reed, Chuck's grandmother, was dear dear friends with our grandmother, uh, Miss Lucilla Griffin, who is the first lady before our mother. And we always call her Aunt Sylvia. Now, we all pretty smart people. I think I was 12 or 13 before I realized she wasn't a blood aunt. You know, that's how close she was and how, how dependable she was to us. And I, Lord, I love the fried chicken and potato salad. But I, you know, one time my daddy was talking with Vernon Johns and they had a guest, I don't remember who he was. And they took me on a ride with them and dropped the guests off at the train station. And they left me at the train station. And it, along comes Ron Seal to save me. And I, I was comfortable. I was headed up the hill because I had my eye on some pie, you know. And I, I thought my mother, she tells that story often, she was going to kill him, you know. Uh, but but they were so engaged in the conversation, they left me and Miss Lucille just said, Lord, Lord, they'd have left this boy and she grabbed me by the hand and we were headed up the hill. You know? Right. It is. I mean, you like will ne never take Farmville out of my heart, I'm telling you. So and everybody that knows me in Farmville knows that too. So and the people out here in California, they know her too. It's just like that's it. It's like, it is a town that I think you feel, at least I do, I think we all do. You feel so much love and so much, you know, I know that I can call Farmville today if I needed anything, anything. I know that anybody in Farmville would help me and I would do the same for them, you know, and it just says a lot about that place, you know. And I'm glad that's where our parents chose to grow us up. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, this is. Because I think it made us. It made us some really stronger people. I'll tell you, like coming out of there. I'm pretty sure I'm solid. I know exactly <laughs> what what I'm about, and I know what <laughs> I'll tolerate. I know what I'll accept. I know what I give people, you know, so thank you, Farmville. I'll, I'll say that, I mean, it takes, I, I'm always lost for words a bit when the amount of grace that, that you all have with regards to, you I mean, you, you experience so much here, a lot of positive, but also a lot of negative. And so, you know, you had a lot of every reason to leave and never look back, but the love you all still have for Farmville and Prince Edward County and the fondness that comes through and you know when you're talking about your memories, I mean it's it's incredible. Um, and and that's something that I think it really humanizes a lot of this this story. Um and the fact that y'all come back, I mean we know a ton of the other families who return to Farmville often in Prince Edward and again that fondness still comes through, even though you know it was turmoil. Um, it's just incredible that grace. That's the that the best way I can describe it is grace, you know, and then it's it's inspirational. Um, and I, I must say. Um, I had a, com a question in the comments, but it's kind of since kind of pulled up too far that I can't see it anymore. Um, but kind of in closing, I wanted to give everybody a chance um, if they had any closing thoughts, uh, closing ideas, just about anything you discussed this evening about about the parents, about their impact on you all. Any anything y'all might want to share with the audience before we kind of close out, we we'll give you a chance for kind of final thoughts. Hmm. Well, I, just I would wanted just. I have to say that my, go ahead, sis. <laughs> you and I keep doing this. Right? 
Um, well, you know, old beauty before you know, whatever. Too. I don't know. <laughs> you know, we have to jump in there when we can. You know, but that's okay. Now, I, I'm I'm just in agreement with my siblings. Um, Farmville is my heart. Uh, I think for me, as a child who was looking forward to starting school. The hardest thing, I mean, for me, having grown up in a loving community, um, was to think that someone who did not know me didn't like me. I couldn't understand that. Um, and to this day, I think if anything bothers me, that bothers me because to know me is to love me. And if you don't know me, how can you judge me? But I, again, along with my siblings, um, am so grateful for the parents we had, for the community that we live in, um, because I always felt love within my community. And I'm grateful that I was able to grow up in Farmville, Virginia. Mm -hmm. I think when Skip was talking about the time, and I just say this real quick, so Skip was talking about the time that dad went to the hospital um, with his the ulcer. Um, but at the same time, mommy was in the hospital having just delivered Ricky, Eric right there, Junior. I mean, mm -hmm. Eric, mm -hmm. <laughs> Senior. And uh, Senior. Yeah. And so we literally, both our parents were in the hospital at the same time. And of course, we were like, oh boy. Like, so Skippy, we were like slapping together bologna sandwiches for us. <laughs> we were like, we got this. So, but before we knew it, here comes a whole troop of women from. Oh no. And they were led doing by. doing so well. <laughs> yeah, the women were led by Mrs. Lucille Reed, our lovely Aunt Seal, who came in. Aunt and just Seal. Control. Yes, she took control. And um, we just had the feeling that everything was going to be okay because our household was still running, even though mommy and daddy were both in the hospital. Um, we just felt that community love. You know, I, I I think that we need to return to some old ways. Now, you know, people talk in platitudes. They say it takes a village to raise a child. But each one of us probably has stories about people who raised us. You know, it's like uh, there are things that I want to do. You know, it's, it's not always easy being a creature's son. And you want to experiment with some things sometimes. Sometimes you have no business experiment. And the difference was, you know, there were men like Mr. Oscar Reed and, and then Mr. Warren Reed and Mr. Truman who used to coach before they closed the school. Man, I couldn't go anywhere now. Little Doc, you know you can't do that. You, you We need you to be something different. And, and it's like, uh, we got, are you going somewhere like, what you up to, son? We got our eye on you. And uh, at that time, I didn't appreciate that eye on me, but the older I got, I realized, <laughs> That was the principle in, re in in actuality. It was a village raising us. And, um, you know, and uh, lessons I got from Mr. Oscar Reed or lessons I got from Dr. Rollins or lessons I got from Mr. Reed, uh, Warren Reed, uh, lessons I got, you know, from different ones, Vernon Johns and stuff. It's like all of that rolls up into me and uh, helped me to be the man that I am, you know. And they really prevented me from being the man that I wanted to experiment with, which was no good for me. So it was the real, the principle of a village raising children. Nowadays, you say something to people's children, they might come after you. Uh, we got, we have to return sometimes to the old ways. You know, they weren't all that bad. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. I, I do want to add this is when Skippy talks about Mr. Warren Reed, um, little known fact that one, another savior of our family was Mrs. Gerald Reed. Correct, yeah, that's true, that's true. 
um, they were another couple that worked well together. Um, so I just want to give her kudos because she did a lot. And she was always there for my mom when my dad had to go out of town. Um, and I remember when I think it was my brother Charles was born. It was Mrs. Drill that drove my mother to the hospital because daddy was out of town. Yes. So we just had that community connection. Um, for me, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Reginald and Harriet White. Yes. They saved me a lot of days. Um, I mean, it's just so many people, you can't name them all, but there's so many people in Farmerville that just made uh, an impact on our lives that will last forever. Yes, I agree. Yes, and you, like I said, we never wanted for anything that if, like, there were times back in, like, the 50s, late 50s, when money wasn't flowing that well and dad was having, you know, daddy was having, like, some um, controversy, you know, with his stand and how people felt about it. And so, you know, like, he was cut off, like, credit. I'm sure everybody knows these whole stories. And, like, you know, people weren't allowing him to buy things on credit, which a lot of people in Farmville did at that time. And I will tell you that one thing. I stand here before God and say, people in Farmville never let us go hungry, ever. We would open the door. There'd be a basket on the porch with eggs and bread and milk. I mean, just people would just drop things off knowing. And nobody did it to, like, knock on the door and say, oh, here, I have something for you. It was all done. It was just left there. And you knew that it was left by somebody who loved us. And yeah, didn't it, it just. So I, I did, somebody did recomment um, that question. And that, I guess I'll, I can ask that real quick and then we can kind of get close. But, um, and it's, and you know, it's Mickey Carrington asked. Um, so what was Reverend Griffin's reaction and advice to each of you when you had to leave Prince Edward County when the schools closed to attend schools elsewhere? Um, what was Reverend Griffin's reaction and advice to each of you when, when and if you had to leave Prince Edward County to go to schools elsewhere? It was Mickey's question. Well, you know, at, and when the schools were first closed, he wanted us to stay because he, he was the leader and we did miss school. The reason we had to go to our grandmother's house was the unsuitability of housing after they took the house down on 116 by eminent domain we just couldn't find a suitable house but as soon as the house was done we were back and there was a man who came through in my, my case a man who came through to raise money and he was impressed by my scholarship and the books i had read and he wanted to send me to prep school and my daddy said well you can go but i prefer if you not go to a prep school. And I didn't go. I, I respected my father and I respected the work he was doing. And then the American Friends Service Committee found a home for us to live in and attend public schools and he went. And he thought it would be a good opportunity for me to see a broader world. And he encouraged me. But he, the one thing in, in my case, I think in all of our cases, and I just said earlier, he encouraged independence. He said, you know, he believed that people ought to stand on their own two feet. And he was, even when it came to fight, and I think all of us have a person, you get in a fight and you come running, that boy hit me. Well, go back and hit him. You know, and uh, and he said, if you can't handle it, then come get me, but learn to handle your own stuff, you know. And uh, so so he wanted me to go off and see, see, see the bigger world and to see where I and develop the confidence to fit in that world. Yeah. I don't know about other, but that was in my instance, uh, being the oldest, he, he, he thought it would be good for me to go and see the, the larger world out there, you know. But he didn't want me to go to a private boarding school. And I, I agreed with him on that. You know. I think, and I think our parents, like all the parents in Farmville, now there's an adult who had children 
I just can't even imagine sending my children off to stay with people I never met before. And I thought, my gosh, how brave our parents were to entrust us, like to put us on buses and planes, in my case, you know, to fly to California to stay with people that they never met. And I really questioned myself, like, could I do that with my kids? And yeah. I, you know, I, I just look at our parents then, for all the kids who grew up in Farmville and whose parents sent them away, who didn't go away, but who made sacrifices and had to make, it's the things that those parents did and the things that they did to, to help us make sure our lives were better just amazing to me because like i said i'm not sure i could have put either one of my kids on a bus or a plane to go stay with people i'd never heard of or never met before so um but um, i mean it helped it changed things i often wondered like what my life would be like if i had stayed in farmville and not left um to go away because I often like, you know, I have these like daydreams cooking. I'm like, you know, we're girls, so we do this. Like, when we go home, we'll be like, oh, I wonder where we would have lived. If we were oh, you know. Um, but we couldn't, and I feel that you know that our experiences helped us. It did. It helped us grow, and it helped me, you know, know how to like really deal with my children and what I wanted to teach them. And I wanted to teach them the same things that my parents taught us. And that was to love God, love family, love community. And to... She always gets in a good role, <laughs> Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> Just when she makes that point. Um, as yeah. for me, um, I was... Um, probably the first one in our family that graduated from school in Prince Edward County, graduated from um, high school in Prince Edward County, because I think when it came to me, my mother had sent two daughters to California, and I was truly waiting my turn to go to California, and she took the brakes on that. She said, no, one of my daughters will stay home and we'll, you know, we've gone through great lunch to make sure that we can have education right here in Prince Edward County. So um, I didn't get the opportunity to go away. I went on um, summer programs. Um, they had different programs of better parents and other programs that I was able to participate in. But as far as my um, school, I stayed in Prince Edward County. And I had a great time. Yeah. And I think even though I went away, this is what I say to people. I say to my friends out here, my friends here too, um, you can take the girl out of Farmville, but you can't take Farmville out of the girl. And that's it. You know, it's like no matter where I went, I was still nausea from Farmville. And I still had Farmville in my heart. So, and that's how I deal with the world. It's like how I learned to live in Farmville. It's how I deal with the world now. And I got it all from growing up there, you know. So. All right. Well, on behalf of Moten, on behalf of the audience, I'm sure I just want to extend another thank you all so much for being willing to share so much of your lives, so much of your parents, so much of your legacy with us. This has been a, a very powerful experience. And I, I know, you know, I work here in the museum. I'm here every day. And I learn something new from hearing you all speak every time. So just want to, again, say thank you all for, for being willing to put, put yourselves out there and your family. Um, and, and to share so much with us tonight. Um, in closing, I want to share something that uh, comes from the town of Farmville. <coughs> this uh, little folder here that I will get sent to you all when we are able, but a proclamation on behalf of, of Griffin Day. So let me, I'll, we'll read it out and then we can kind of close from there. So, Reverend L. Francis Griffin Day Senior, uh, Reverend L. Francis Griffin Senior Day Proclamation. Whereas Wednesday, September 16th, September 15th, 2021, is the 104th birthday of Reverend Francis Griffin Sr. 
whereas Reverend Griffin was known lo locally and nationally as the fighting preacher, a civil rights advocate who led the fight for civil rights and education, and was a voice of opposition to the decision by the Prince Edward County Schools to close that in the new rate. Whereas Reverend Griffin led the civil rights movement of Farmville in the late 1940s until his death in 1980. And whereas Reverend Griffin dedicated his life to full commitment and passion to guaranteeing that all people would have equal rights. And whereas Reverend Griffin was guided by his belief in God, family, and community. And whereas Reverend Griffin was quoted saying, unless the people are free, the spirits are destroyed. And if we love democracy, we can't give up the fight, not only for our sake, but for the sake of America. Whereas in recognition of his life will live and the dedication he had for his community and fellow man, be it further resolved that David E. Waters, mayor of the town of Farmville, we hereby proclaim Wednesday, September 15, 2021, to be Reverend L. Francis Griffin's senior day. So here is the copy of that proclamation. Um, and I think it's very well, very well deserved in that case, and, and certainly a, a testament to the legacy of, of you all's family and, and Reverend Griffin. So with that, we will go ahead and close out. Uh, thank you so much to all of our panelists, the, the Griffin children. Um, thank you to everybody who has, has watched, who has commented, who's followed along. Um, this will kind of stay up on our some of our pages. So if anybody is late and, you know, to see it and want to see it later, you're welcome to do that as well. Um, this has been wonderful. I know I've learned a lot. Hopefully everybody else has too. And I hope everybody has a wonderful evening. Thanks so much for tuning in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.